This episode of No Simple Road is sponsored by the one, the only, Nugs.net. It's the live music app featuring over 15,000 shows from your favorite bands on demand and ad-free. Ad-free? Ad-free. No ads. Sans ads. You can listen to a show from last night or from 40 years ago. You can download music to listen offline and you can create playlists to share with your friends. That's... That's cool. Mm-hmm. I like that Blaze made you and me a playlist. Yeah, my running playlist. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And Thanks, Blaze. Yeah. And, you know, not for nothing, but it's cool to have a wide variety of bands to listen to. I mean, there's everything from Metallica to Magic Beans on Nugs, you know? It's a kind of spans the gamut of musical genre. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot in there. <laughs> So, as live music fanatics like us, the folks at Nugs.net are offering the No Simple Road family a free 30-day trial. That's cool. Listen free for 30 days and cancel anytime. Visit Nugs.net forward slash No Simple Road to get started. That's N-U-G-S dot net forward slash No Simple Road. All one word. Get started. Get 30 days of music for free. And you will be addicted. Addicted to nugs. Yep. <laughs> and the the good kind of nugs. Yeah, this is good nugs. Yeah. Live music. Mm-hmm. Nothing better. Mm-hmm. Just Soothes saying. the soul. Take care of your ears. I like to say that Shop Tour Bus is part of the No Simple Road family. Well, then you should say that. No Simple Road? Who's that? <laughs> oh, wait. Shop Tour Bus is part of the No Simple Road family. Yay. Yay. Uncle Shop Luke. Tour Bus. Uncle Luke and the roadies over at Shop Tour Bus are creating one-of-a-kind, Grateful Dead-inspired t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, little enamel bus pins, cool, cool. stuff. You could end up with action figures, candies, just... There's so many possibilities. I want to end up with an action. I want to be an action figure. You should be. I should. You'd be a fun one. What, what, what you, your I... beard would turn into a cape. It like <laughs> goes, uh, like then sticks I fly, out. I would fly and... on my back, <laughs> face up. That's a lot to look into. That would yeah. Do. No simple road action figures. Yeah, man. Oh, how cute. And we could have them sold by Shop Tour Bus. Oh my gosh. In you know fun little like boxes to... like that, mm-hmm. you get four little action figures. Oh my God! I, that's our new thing. What Apple? Do it. I, I just gotta say, Luke, uh, we, we we need some more live music from you posted. Oh, right now. Mm-hmm. Just, just do it, do it, brother. Head over to <laughs> shoptourbus.com online or at shoptourbus on Instagram. Get yourself a t-shirt, a hoodie, or a sticker. Buy one for a friend or a pal or You'll a lover. You'll get a bootleg also with a pencil to spool it mm-hmm. and You're a one of a kind box. Stuff. A whole lot of intention here and love. Yeah, you can you can actually purchase something that was loved and will also, be loved. You can also say, I'm going to purchase more than I bargained for. Mm-hmm. And you're going to get it for free. Mm-hmm. If you put in the promo code No Simple Road when no you Simple check Road. out, you will get it free shipping just free for you. Free shipping. Just for you, Apple. That's pretty free awesome. shipping. Well, actually, well, not for everybody. Not just, but <laughs> just for everybody. Well, just for me if I'm the one putting in the code. This is but true. anybody else that puts in the code also <laughs> will get that free shipping. What's the code again? No, no Simple Road. Road. All right. Head over to shoptourbus.com online or at shoptourbus on Instagram. Put in the promo code No Simple Road when you check out and you will get more free than shipping. you bargained for. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Apple, where do you work? Where do I work? I work at <laughs> Define, Define Premium, Premium Cannabis. cannabis. Yes, yes, yes. I just thought we should throw, mix it up a little bit. That was funny. Yeah. Because you know what? Apple works at one of our fantastic sponsors who is here in Portland and has two locations in the Hillsborough and Forest Grove areas. And they have a full selection of designer cannabis for all of your needs. So if like you wanna, what? Well, like say you hurt yourself at work and you got a bruise on your thigh. Well, if and you hurt yourself at work, you're going to get a piss test. So no, don't go that's to not define. true. That's, that's not, not true. true. Oh, okay. Why? Right. What, what like, was he talking about? I don't like, know. He's got to throw So anyway, so I, so I did. At my so work. I, did, I hurt myself. I bruised myself a little at work. What, what do I need? You need a topical. You need something, oh. a nice little rub that's going to help to... Uh, calm the inflammation and give that 
topical area, maybe a little numbness, a little tingling. And then maybe if you got a little joint, you can smoke that and then that'll make you feel better too. And you forgot all about that little bruise that you got at work and you're all good. What if I just want to have fun on the weekend? You can go and get a little edible. You can get some flour. You can get a dabble and you'll really have a good time on the weekend. And is there like different kinds of flour and and stuff that for different moods? It's all the same. Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, absolutely. Of course there is. There's all, right. all kinds of different strains, different flowers, different um, ways to consume these edibles and smokables and topicals. And you're just going to have a fun. It's literally like an adult in a candy store. Yes. It is literally like that. Yep. yep. So and we have candy. Yeah. Um, head on over <laughs> to um, Hillsboro or Forest Grove. And if you tell them upon checkout that you listen to No Simple Road, they are going to give you 10% off and a free t-shirt. Yep. They're going to give you a free t-shirt because they're going to be like, we want you to support us so that you can let other people know that we support No Simple Road, we support Define, and that we have amazing cannabis here. So go to the location in Hillsboro, ask for Apple during the week, or go to the location in Forest Grove. Many, any, all of the fine bud tenders out there will will take care of you, Mm -hmm. educate you, get you what you need, send you on your way with a smile on your face and your wallet won't be smashed because you're going to get 10% off. I will say when you get that little taped up bag and you walk out, that is a happy moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And it is like, it is like a secret. Yeah. It's a secret. Your secret. secret stash bag. And it's like, "Mm." Mm -hmm. yeah, it is very exciting walking out with your stash bag. So go on out and get yourself um, some fine cannabis products and take care of your Mm -hmm. Head. No simple road. No simple road. No simple road. No simple road. Osiris. I'm Richard E. Rastafarian from Fear of a Craft Beer Planet, a podcast that talks a lot about the parallels between the beer industry and the music business. But really, we talk about whatever we want. The show is made up of four of us. Me, Richard the Rastafarian, the radio guy, Jay Rose, Ryan Egan, and Rob Forzik. They're the beer guys. They're the ones that teach me about craft beer, and I'm the one that gets the show on the air. You can find us on all social media platforms at Fear of a Craft Beer Planet. Hey now, no simple road family. I'm getting staying from Aaron over here. Mel, <laughs> Mel's giving me instructions as I hit the the record button. Um, we're allowed. We need instructions. We all could use a side glance every now and then, but that one didn't deserve it. And giving you whale eye. Yep. Hi Mel. Hi Aaron. Hi Apple. Hi. Don't give me stink eye like <laughs> that, dude. Well, I'm just yeah. mad. I'm not impressed yet. I'm waiting to see if you do it right. Do, what am I supposed to do? I now I feel I pressure. What do I do with my hands? I don't know. Put them on your so knees. So anyway, everybody, welcome Work. back Hi. to No Simple Road. <laughs> this is week, midweek. This we is going to have... be a midweek drop, and this is yep. really special. Yes. We've sat on this for a moment, as you know. We took, I didn't we took last this. week off. Uh, Summer Meltdown first part came out yesterday. This is a carryover, which we decided is a standalone episode. Yeah, it yeah. needed its own yeah. space in this, this on the planet. When this we, was recorded yeah. at Northwest String Summit uh, many, mm-hmm. many weeks ago now. and <sighs> Seems like yeah. another lifetime. Well, this episode was awesome because not only was it um, Rob Baracco from Dark Star Orchestra, whom... They have a special place in our family's heart, but it was like he took so much time with us and we couldn't just roll it into the episode because, you know, sometimes when those episodes are long, you're like kind of trying to fast forward or do whatever, not everybody, but some people. And so you might miss this and we didn't want you to miss it because he gave a lot of his um, background and just talked so openly and it was a really fun super enlightening interview with Rob and he's just a really cool guy and it made me appreciate Dark Star even more than Mm -hmm. I already appreciate Dark Star like they really set the tone at Northwest String Summit when we were there for the entire weekend for me personally like they came out that first night and just killed it. 
Yeah. And it was so much fun. And just, it really did set the whole vibe for the weekend. Do you remember the first time we saw Dark Star? Mm. Or what, should I, I should say, which was the first time? In Vegas. Was it in Vegas? What? Did we see them in Vegas? That's what I was trying to I don't remember. know. I don't know. I, I think. I think. Are they? Are, I think are, maybe uh, it might have been at the here? Roseland. Yeah, up yeah. here. What? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a. Uh, every show that we've gone to to see Dark Star has been a monumental I, watershed moment for the family. Yeah, I don't remember why I had such an aversion to it at first. I had no idea why there was. I didn't know about anybody in the band. I didn't know anything about it. But I was like, ugh. And when I went, that ugh disappeared instantly. Yeah. They are so amazing, and Rob just plays like he's having so much fun Mm -hmm. all the time. That's the one thing, like, in talking to him, well, first of all, he looks like my mom's side of the family. He We look like we could totally fucking be related. Mm -hmm. And then, second, hearing his whole story, it just shows that he could never have been doing anything else. Like, he's exactly where he's supposed to be doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And to see the the shine in his eyes and the smile on his face mm-hmm. as he talks about it, it it just lets you know that, like, if you follow what your passion are, it's, you're going to be a happy person. Yeah. <laughs> and how important and the, his family is to him. Yeah. Yeah, this was amazing. This is, this is also one where we we're at the festival. We were usually getting 15... 20 minutes, half hour most with everybody because everybody's, you know, got things to do. And he came and sat down. Next thing we know, it was almost an hour. It, yeah. And it, it, his manager, whoever came, poked his head in and was like, Rob, you got to go on stage pretty soon, bro. Mm-hmm. Right? So thank you so much for sitting down yeah, and Rob. doing this with us, Rob. That this day was... was particularly beautiful, too. We were sitting in our um, pop up, our easy up, and it was breezy. It was not too hot. Like the. I don't know. The sky was perfect. I just remember it was like a really like picturesque. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a good day there. So think about that while you guys listen to the interview. Yeah. This is done inside of our little 10 by 10 pop up and we kind of close the door, if so to speak on the front of it. Mm-hmm. We put the curtains up, put the curtain down. Yeah, and, we did. And doctors in session mm-hmm. oh. and just kind of sat around a little table and talked about stuff that mattered. And it was really fun. And, and, like I said before, getting to know the the people behind the music really does something special for the music for me. It it makes it deeper, it makes it more rich, and the experience is so much more. And then like meeting people like Rob, it's just doubly so. Like, yeah. And it, I, I'm really, really grateful to his management, the tour manager. Like, I wish I could remember his name right now. Because he just made it so simple mm-hmm. and brought rob over to meet us and And it was instant comfort comfortability Mm -hmm. immediately Mm -hmm. and he was so willing to take a picture too he's like oh yeah like let's let's, come on let's do this Mm -hmm. just um you know we were just on an interview and i'm not going to say what it was but talking about um giving more than you take and that's how I felt about Rob. He gives so much in his music. And then he gave us just that much more by sitting down mm-hmm. with us. So if you're listening, Rob, thank you again for sharing your time and your talents um, with us. And it was a great time. Not not to be cheesy, but we're grateful. Okay. Well, well now, you just, now I'm going to go roll on the cheesy because I just had a memory... There, this was because he's from New York. Mm-hmm. We were talking about it. Mel, there was a connection there too. I just all of a sudden got one of the, I got like a smell memory of like, I felt like I was in New York. He took us down like through his childhood, yeah. this and that. Mm-hmm. Mel was talking about our childhood. And then you yeah, had the New York pizza guy. I remember smelling the pizza and there was like a breeze blowing through mm-hmm. the tin by. Yeah. And it kind of mm-hmm. set the, it, really it kind of set the, the <laughs> it was like a, being at a New York like street carnival and there's, awesome pizza being made right there and, and we did sit, we we were next to the pizza guys uh semi truck your headphones are backwards are they yeah you have them on the wrong ears flip yeah, them there you go anyway I I, it was it was driving me crazy <laughs> Obvious, obviously dude. that was pretty, that was pretty aggressive wow. i know i know I, I, he was like trying to be sweet guys he was like touching them nice and then he couldn't help <laughs> he's pawing at him like a kitten <laughs> <laughs> those those are all wrong mel 
Oh. I miss Northwest String Summit, you guys. That was so fun. It was. Yeah. It was really, so, really yeah, so, this so fun. Yeah, this is taking us down that road again a little. Yeah. That's what's special about like having this sitting for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. I love what I love. I've realized post festival, what I enjoy most about the festival is not having time mean anything. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Being like, on vacation. The second we get there and it, we, everything's set up and stuff and our bellies are full, we don't want anything, everything's good, then it's like, now what? Mm-hmm. And, and the world is your oyster, the area. You can like, lay in your chair, yeah. your hammock from Eno. Oh, you guys. <laughs> so this is what happened during Northwest String Summit. And you guys, this is a repeat, but so what? You guys are, some people and are here again. Yeah, yeah, some people are new to it's this. It's worthy. We were in Northwest String Summit and we saw all these beautifully colored hammocks tied around the, t- the trees all near the stage and just kind of around and about. Eno was the name on the hammocks and they also had a cool little 10 by 10 set up and they were talking about their product and signing people up and doing a wrap. I think they were selling hammocks. Yeah, they were doing all of it. They were doing all of it. So in informing people about the brand and all that. And so Aaron and we just, we thought it'd be a great way to get us another sponsor. Why not? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so how cool would it be is if we had Rob and uh, Banshee Tree and everybody else that we interviewed sitting on Eno hammocks and Eno chairs and being out having No Simple Road outfitted by Eno. So Aaron wrote this beautiful email to Eno and here we have gotten some really beautiful products from Eno. We got some like little sling back hammock, camping chairs, camping chairs, three, three camping chairs, three hammocks. And uh, um, we haven't received it yet. It's in the mail, but the stands to hold three hammocks, so like a little triangle. And so we just wanted to give a grateful and thankful shout out to Eno for uh, sponsoring and outfitting No um, Simple Simple Road. Road. Um, Your products are amazing. The colors are fantastic. They're made out of parachute. They're all thoughtfully made, intentionally made. So if you guys are so comfortable. Yeah. Eagle's Nest, Nest Outfitters. Yeah, yeah so I was going to say, fits. you can go to it's Eagle's like Nest Eagle, Outfitters. It's like a comfy Eagle's Nest. Yeah, it's well, he knows like you. NSR. <laughs> you yeah. can go to eaglesnestoutfitters.com online and check out all the stuff they have. And if it wasn't for Northwest String Summit, we wouldn't even be talking about this. That's right. No. And the other thing I wanted to talk about before we get to the interview is um, the Mount Tam Psilocybin Summit. You can go to psilocybinsummit.com forward slash NSR. And let me make sure that's right. I think that's right. And it's the 19th through the 22nd of this month. And uh, it's a online summit that is talking about the magic of magic mushrooms, of the medicines that we all love and know, and the, um, what do you call it? The genesis of where it came Origins. from and the, and the Mazatec and it's it's really cool what they're doing man and give me a second i'm i'm filling right now because i'm blowing it <laughs> somebody somebody talk are you feeling do something well feeling? what they're doing is they're going through all of the different like how to grow and um easy and um, using usable or safe practices mm-hmm. um all different topics about um the entheogens and um psilocybin not entheogens but just psilocybin specifically so um i got it here we go here we go psilocybin summit dot com spell it for you guys p-s-i-l-o-c-y-b-i-n as in nancy summit.com forward slash nsr and and the there we go some of the stuff they're going to be talking about is like policy uh, decriminalization cultivation creating ceremony uh, traditional culture bringing the mazatec knowledge to us and it's important to know the lineage and where the stuff comes from man so yeah. we're really grateful to daniel for doing what he's doing and and thank you brother and for you including break, no simple road in that if you break down each one of those topics that you talked about there is a lot to be said about each one of those like creating ceremony yeah like that's a big huge topic mm-hmm. and policy like how we're going to go forward and so decriminalization yeah education and respect yeah yeah so this is a really amazing cause important uh lectures yeah you- and if you go to the forward the psilocybin summit.com forward slash nsr you're getting 10 percent off participation in the summit 
Um, and then there's different tiers that you can sign up for. You can go for the first day for free. You can just go check it out. And then, um, you know, the other ones will allow you to keep the files and all that stuff. So go check it out. You guys, that's, he's part of the No Simple Road yes, family and Daniel, thank you. former guest and one of our brothers. So hook it up. But you know, there's other business we need to do too, people. Yeah, I'm just saying. You're gonna do some business. Do I'm, I'm business. gonna do it. It's but you know, do the business. is it really business at this not point? Really. No, because mm-hmm. it's not business because it's very no, personal. I hate that it even came to be that way. It's personal, not business. All of this is business. Or, um, all, this is business. <laughs> all this is business. None of it's business. That's not what I meant. To Don't say. tell no, me. It's, per, it's, it's personal for, for their. Therefore, it's not really business. Yeah, it is personal. Mm-hmm. It's personal. We're taking our personal time talking about our personal experiences and reaching out to you guys on a personal level to tell you what's going on in our world. So what well, the way that you could stay involved with us is check us out on all the social media platforms at No Simple Road. Go to Instagram and subscribe to the channel. Check it out. See what's coming up, what's going on, what's shaking. Go over to www.nosimpleroad.com. That's where all the new and past episodes are. You can go to the family tab to ch- sign up for the newsletter and you know what? I f- keep forgetting to tell you guys this every week when we do this, but when you guys post on Instagram, use the hashtag no simple road when you do that and it'll grow our little Instagram community. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. It'll make sure we see it too. Mm-hmm. And also up on the website, no simple road.com. There's merch and stickers and pins and shirts and you know, all kinds of stuff. So go check it out over there. And also Reddit r forward slash no simple road. I posted a question on the reddit the other day and i'm not going to tell you what the question is you have to go to the reddit to check out the question and give give me an answer so i'd appreciate it if those of you that are redditly inclined would go over there and do that that would be super cool well yeah. what's the answer uh, you'll see don't 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 <laughs> can i read am it? I jumping ahead of myself no don't Why read not? it make them go there and, and look at it no 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 uh, also we have the discord server going on and last but not least patreon Tell us about Patreon, Apple. Oh, man. This this is one of the most important things to us. This is how we keep it going, like we always say, you know, keeping fuel in the tank. And, you know, we need your help. We need you to become Chan Donators, as we call them, and give your support. Give a buck. I know I, monthly I spend on, on little games on my phone, you know, the 99 cents here and this and that there. I spend a whole lot. In a month, it adds up. So, I mean, like a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, whatever you can give. It really makes us feel good to see the support, and it is what keeps us going forward. And like we always say, we want we want to be doing this, like, all the time. And that's one of the monumental things that can help us get there is by going over there and following us, give, giving those cute dollars, giving, mm-hmm. the, you know, whatever you can afford. We have – it varies all over the board. Um I don't know. It just shows the support. Yeah, man. And it it, does. It's it's how we pay for what we do. And we are all in this together. I spend my own money on the show all the time. So does Apple. So does Mel. Every bit of the Patreon goes right back. And it's just to make this better for you guys and for us. It's so funny because Melanie, Aaron, Apple, and Ryder are, they live in this house. And then Melanie, Apple, Ryder, and Aaron all are no simple road. So no matter how you cut it, whatever you guys give to us, be it monetarily, be it um, written or verbally, we're receiving it all. And that we use that energy, no matter how it's given to us, to affect us, to influence us and give it right back to you in the form of a show. Right. So no matter what you're doing um, to help us, you are helping us make no mistake you're helping us and so just when you add the monetary aspect it just pushes us in the butt that much further along yeah and you know what man look at it like this i know that it's weird like the world has changed things are different now Mm -hmm. we support things in way different ways than we used to years ago and this podcast medium right now where we're at in time that is how you can support the shows that you like. Mm-hmm. It, traditionally with television, they would sell advertising and then you going and supporting and buying those products is how those television shows that you like to watch got paid. That's not the way things are anymore. We're doing this on our own, man. Mm-hmm. And it's between you and us. So it's like you investing in the entertainment that you like directly. 
Do you recall like, or maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but think about like, we used to not realize that by like looking at the shows that we look at or buying the products um, that we're supporting them. We never thought we're like supporting it. Like, yeah, like we're, holding it together. Like yeah, that's yeah. Holding we, we, we never together. thought of it that way. No, and so now we're changing it. Realize, like, well, if you don't like how fast foods do business, then don't buy their don't product. Support it. That's supporting them. So on the flip side, if you do like what something, somebody, a company, a corporation, a group of people are doing, if you do like that, supporting them would be the same thing. It's buying that three dollar drink or buying that ten dollar combo or buying that fifty dollar t shirt or whatever mm-hmm. the case is. Like it's supporting what you um want more of or what you approve of or what you believe in. Right. And it's also we've managed to cut out the middleman. It's it's directly an exchange between you out there listening and us. Yeah. It's there's nobody in the middle taking their cut. It's it's direct support. So if you that, listen that, every week and you dig No Simple Road, give a buck a month, man. It's a quarter a show, you know. It's it that's one thing about podcasting too. It is the, it is the cheapest free pretty much cheapest it is form of entertainment and it is also the like we we listen when people you know you do have a say so in what mm-hmm. we do we listen we love feedback oh, we you know speaking, that doesn't yeah. happen with most entertainment platforms it's boxed can't you know we spend a whole lot of money every month on internet access <clears throat> cable tv all the different Netflix, types of listening Prime, yeah everything that stuff adds up to hundreds of dollars for our household in a month of entertainment and for a dollar a month yeah right <laughs> right well, and to be listened to and responded to right? it's, it's one thing we're at about podcast so throwing it back and changing it just a little bit we want to say thank you to our canadian friend who came to oh, visit madison. us madison. and thank you thank you so much you know she asked us a really important question and i've been thinking about it ever since she asked what she said you guys are around a lot of people all the time and i just oh. wonder what do you guys do to um like protect save your protect energy. your energy oh. and at when she asked that my immediate thought was like well we just are like that was my immediate immediate head thought like we just have a natural protection and then you know i i can't even remember what i asked her but we did say something along those lines like there's there's good people in our life so we Mm -hmm. have kind of like a good energy field but even thinking about it deeper like we, everybody could be doing more to protect their energy. I think that's, or not protect, or maybe just like um, sustain it. Right. Right. Um, but you guys make no mistake when you're in like interacting with people, that is an energy exchange. And so if you are like for the Madison, she came out here and what a beautiful en- energy exchange that was. Yeah, man. She gave us talk about, um, protection or whatever it's people like that that help build up our force field if yeah, you will man. she she added to us in a positive way where my mom my mom she couldn't understand she's like where was that girl from and i was like oh yeah she's from canada she's like but why did she come here and I was she like, listens to the show she was, wrote me an email and said she was going to yeah, be in portland like my mom just couldn't understand why somebody would want to come here and meet like what was she doing here did, well, you did she want something specific or insert tv show name here Friends. Con- contact and go hang Monica. out go hang, and go, out, and go hang out yeah <laughs> it's you don't do that but this isn't that we yeah. are not that we're family we're no simple road family and it's a real thing yeah but it was just um having her here was a beautiful thing she's a beautiful person first yeah, of all what a just sweetheart. a striking beauty very soft spoken and beautiful but you can tell that she's very mindful There's she's power got there. yeah she's got a lot on her mind she's got a lot to say and so i i, I had to bounce out a little early that night cuz i was so exhausted <laughs> from just the day but i want you to know madison when you listen back that i really appreciate your visit i really really appreciate you reaching out and and we needed it just as much yeah, as you did we really yes. did need you to come and just be with us that night right so on. thank you so and that just reminded me that i got to make pancakes today because i still haven't oh, uh, that's uh, other than taking like a sip of that oh, maple yeah, she syrup, i've not syrup. made pancakes yeah she brought us treats that. and, and she brought the thank best you. coffee i've had in a really long time oh that kick ass coffee mm-hmm. 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 my god so look at that
like our sweet little like niece from you know from Canada, Canada came and brought us Canadian gifts, Canadian chocolate and coffee and maple syrup. Like you guys, that's the power it, of one of the show of the show and, of podcasting community technology. And Madison, when you hear this, make sure your parents know we thank them too because yeah. can't blame that they're like protective parents that were worried about well, dropping you're going their to some off people's with, house that have a radio show. Yeah. What the fuck? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. We had a wonderful time. You raised a wonderful daughter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for not beating me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just good all the way around. Give us those five star reviews on iTunes and, and Apple Podcasts. And we don't have any new ones this week, but nope. we would love to read some next week. So yeah, if you guys. haven't left one yet, go ahead and leave one right now before we get to the Rob Barocco interview. And you could be like, I'm just about to listen to the Rob Barocco interview. And I think No Simple Road is awesome. Five stars. And then you can move on with your day. And then we will we'll read it next week. And and we'll, we'll be, be like, very Wait, excited about that's it. That's not we'll original. It I already said that. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. So if that. you haven't already, go listen to our Northwest String Summit um, double episode and then listen to this one. And then if you haven't already, listen to our first installment of Summer Meltdown. And yeah. Get enjoy, yourself caught up. Yeah. Enjoy this awesome interview with Rob Baraka. This was a great time for all of the. the just this whole festival. Yep. Both of these festivals were amazing. Yep. And here's another part of it. Without further ado, the No Simple Road crew gives you. Rob, Rob Baracco of Dark Star Thank you Orchestra. Thanks so much for coming and hanging out with us for a few minutes, Rob. I appreciate you, man. it. Um, it's good to be here. So, have you ever been to Hornings before? Once, a uh, long, long time ago, uh, in the 90s, I came here for one of uh, String Cheese's events. Okay. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, his name is John Dwork, who resides in uh, uh, Portland, was the promoter, and, and he. He had them come and he, he put together this unbelievable event. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, they had like all these different camps and the camps had themes and I fell in love with this place. I was like, God, we, I need to play here someday. So here I am. And now it's happening. And what's really funny about it is I, I've been telling Dark Star for, for a long time now. We do this thing back in Ohio called the Dark Star Jubilee every, yeah, yeah. every Memorial Day weekend. And I always said if we ever wanted a franchise it to do the west coast we have to do it here oh shit! because it's built in exactly the way it is in ohio I'm, I'm, i don't know about the jubilee so the jubilee is three three days on memorial day weekend we have um, we used to have multiple stages we decided to cut that out because i'm not a big fan of the constant music it's like one thing ends another thing starts yeah. nobody can catch a breath oh, no shit, man. and to me it's not a natural flow um, you know, the old festivals, you had to wait, you get a half an hour or maybe 45 minutes. And so anyway, um, I digress. The, so we have a, uh, this structure uh, on this on this place. is the It's the old um, uh, 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 Buckeye Lake that the dead used to play. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they built this permanent structure. It's a humongous stage. And we have, I don't know, we have about 20 bands. And uh, we play each night. Uh, it's it's something. It's it's we get about four thousand people, and we want to keep it small like that. Why there? Our our manager um, just thought it would be a good place for it because everything's built in. The camping is the most important thing. You want the camping on site, right? You know, I've been to other festivals where, you, where like well, even like, like the Oregon Country Fair. Of course, you can't compare that to anything else because it's the greatest thing on earth. But there's no camping there. Can you imagine if the Oregon Country Fair had camping and people could hang out? At the nighttime, but then it got probably wouldn't be as special, right? right. <laughs> it would be way different, way different. <laughs> and yeah, nighttime there is well, my favorite on earth. But. Anyway, <laughs> did you just go? Did you just go to the fair? No, unfortunately, uh, I had. Uh, it, it's an interesting week for me. Usually, my daughter um, always rents a house on Nantucket. Oh yeah, and uh, and it's really hard to say no to her. <laughs> We get it. Yeah, we get it. I mean, I, so so much so that I, I I moved to Cape Cod from New York because of her. You know, she was oh. insistent. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's We're it's dealing it's with this fam. You know, family is really really important, and I, I'm a big family guy. And uh, yeah. have they been have they been like really supportive? Of you oh all yeah. Of you? Oh yeah. yeah. You know. you when when my kids were little, uh, I wasn't a touring musician. I was I played locally in New York and uh, I also did like TV work. I did the Cosby Show. He just I told her that. that. Yeah, it was such a in different world. 
oh and Different that World, which was a, you know, it was a really interesting gig for me. I mean, here's, you know, I'm playing with uh, probably the top studio musicians in the world wow. for the top show in the world. Yeah. It was <laughs> Got to meet him time. a whole bunch, you know. Yeah. He's a really cool guy, and, you know, it's kind of a drag what happened. Yeah. I get people telling me now, you're going to take it off your resume? I'm like, what are you, no, <laughs> you talking about? Fuck would I did you ever do anything to you? Come oh, on. No. Oh. No, dumb. That's, that's dumb. Fine. Come on, didn't he root for you? No, my no, God. No, no. Why would you take it off your resume? Like, what, because of whatever happened, you uh, didn't play keys? Like, give me a break. So, yeah, so when my kids were little, uh, I played local gigs and, uh, and I did that. And uh, so we had this incredible bond. And when I started going on the road, they were intrigued. Okay. Although, you know, they... They also knew dad wasn't home. <laughs> yeah. So um, when I when I got to, when I started playing with Phil Lesh, um, they my daughter was, uh, I guess, a young, young teen. Okay. Yeah, she was not quite college yet. And my son was maybe in a preteen. And uh, they, they grew up with the Lesh's kids, you know, so it was kind of cool. It was a real family thing. And they loved it. So. When my daughter was, you know, in high school, and she'd drag her friends to all the shows, forget it, you know. It's like, you know, we play, we play this place called Jones Beach. So she loved it. Yeah, she'd bring her friends, and you know, they'd have these big screens, you know, and she'd be standing there, going, that's, that's my right. dad. <laughs> we uh, we played Madison Square Garden, and uh, where I was set up on the stage, I could see her. She was in the front row with her friends, and it was just one of those moments, you know. It's like your heart just swells. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. First of all, from you to her and from her to you with her friend, like my dad and we're really grooving. It's yeah. not like, okay, it's it's your dad. No, they like, were, you know, their their musical taste ran the gamut. I, I I was really proud of my kids for the the kinds of music they were into. The, you know, they were not only were they Grateful Dead, they they were Beatle freaks, but then they also were into you know everything that was happening so at that time. No, not at all. You know, they knew they knew all the rap stuff, which kind of blew my mind. You know, but. You know, my daughter would sit there and, and sing that stuff, and I just crack up. Yeah. Did she end up in the music industry? My daughter was a was a phenom as a little kid. I mean, I had her. I, I taught when I when she was really little uh, in an exclusive music school, and uh, I got her uh, uh, free like you know yeah, lessons and stuff. You know, free 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 tutoring there, and uh, she was studying with this uh, incredible woman from China, and. Uh, the woman came up to me one day, she was about six, and she says, if she keeps on this track, she's Juilliard bound, she's going to be a concertizing, amazing, she's really got it. Yeah. Yeah. Then she turned 12. It's oh. genetic. And became super social butterfly. And of course, it all went out the window because she didn't want to, she didn't want to sit home for five hours a day and practice. No way. What You're kid wants busy. to do that? And I would yeah. never, and I, as, a, as a teacher and as a musician, I know you can't force that thing on, on yeah. children. They, I it's, it had, yeah, you have, like me, I, I just always loved it. It's yeah, what I identified, no, I identified with it. You know, her, she identified with her friends. Yeah. <laughs> but the one thing we always knew she'd become was an attorney because you couldn't argue with this child. You say the same thing about our son <laughs> ever. She won every argument. I don't think there was ever an argument even I when ever she's won. She's wrong, right? Oh, she yeah. it, when she was wrong, it was even worse. Yeah. Yes, dude. Yes. Even more conviction. You think, you think Trump is bad at at, uh, <laughs> at you know arguing his case? She, she never. And she's now a very successful attorney. Her oh, and she's married to an attorney, and you know, so yeah. it's all good. Good on her. Yeah, yeah. You say that you've always been connected to the music. Yeah, it's. Been, I mean, do you have like a, a a first memory of oh, like where you felt uh, it? I have a, a d defining moment. All right. Wow. Now, well, both a actually. Divine, defining. Okay. Yeah, it's divine and defining. Yeah. So, when I was really little, this is before I can remember. My parents always knew that I'd be a musician because they said the way I reacted to music was unusual to them. Like I, as soon as the music went on, I was like. Nothing else mattered. It was all about that. I'd sit there like in the crib, you know. Well, anyway, so. Were they 
music like freaks before or they like they were super my, my parents loved music now they grew up uh in, in the big band era uh, tommy dorsey oh yeah they would be okay. huge tommy dorsey artie shaw frank sinatra count basie all that stuff duke ellington all that stuff they, it's great my dad was loved to sing a terrible musician <laughs> but he but he could see he sang really well he just had no time my mother used to conduct him it was hilarious. I used to have to play. Drag me. We had a theater organ in the house, and oh, he wow. he'd make me sit and uh, and uh, and force me to play for my relatives. Oh, it was awful. All these oh. Italian love songs. <laughs> femina, la mala femina. <laughs> oh, awesome. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the way I grew up. But the defining moment was uh, '63. Beatles play Ed Sullivan show and I watch it Sunday evening Beatles come on like a silver bullet in the forehead John Lennon I knew in my little six year old brain that I was going to do that I had, had no idea what that meant what? Yeah. Or, or what it entailed but I knew that and I looked at my mother I was like I'm going to be him and she laughed you know, like, yeah right the Beatles. Okay, I I think about stuff like that because I'm a mom, and then you have those moments with your kid. So your mom had that moment with you, and then she sees you doing this. Yeah. So she is there a reference point? Do you guys go back to that? Oh, well, we did. She's no longer with us, unfortunately. But we talked about it. But she did something really funny. Like less than two weeks later, she walks in the house one day, and she hands me a guitar, and I'm just like. Oh, speechless, yeah. speechless. And she goes, you know, there's strings attached to this. Uh, and I went, huh? He's six years old. What does that mean? Like, yeah. Mom's got jokes. Yeah, mom's got jokes, but, oh but Rob doesn't understand right. what a joke is. <laughs> Quite, you yeah. know. So uh, the strings attached were, I had to take lessons. Okay. okay. So there was a guy in my, the development where I lived on Long Island. Um, his name was Tony. And Tony rented uh, the back part of a house. And he taught there a couple days a week. So I went to him and, uh, you know, he wanted me to learn how to play jazz guitar. I was like, jazz guitar? I want to learn Beatles songs. Uh, I want to learn Rolling Stones songs, Beatles songs, and anything that was popular on the radio. I wasn't interested in, in jazz. But he taught me jazz. He was teaching me all these chords. And I just, I just, I ate it up. So, what it was, you're just, yeah. Just teaching yeah. Alone so, about, yeah. Yeah. So by the time I was seven, uh, I, I was actually I started writing stupid little songs and uh, had a band. I, I had a real garage band. I mean, we actually At played. Seven? We used to practice in the garage because his parents, uh, the, the drummer, parents wouldn't let us play in the house, so we had to play in the garage. What? Were so supportive. They had oh, to have been yeah. like they, uh, overly supportive to allow that. Yeah. They um. The lessons, the instruments, um, uh, bought me an electric guitar and an amplifier. Yeah, I forget. I thought I was king shit after that. Oh, yeah, oh, when, it's, when it's electrified. Fuck yeah, yeah, it, it was. Now. It was a big, huge deal, you know. And um, you know, and I, and my town, you know, there there weren't that many musicians, so yeah. it became right away. I gravitated towards the older musicians, and they accepted me, and you know, so I played in bands. From, just because, well, I could play, and they were older, and it was it was cool. <laughs> Rob, do you do you think maybe it's some past life shit? I don't know. Who's to say? I, I you know, my whole life I, I wanted to believe in karma, right, and all that stuff. I don't know. Who knows, you know, right? I don't know. I've come to this place now where I, it's okay. Whatever it is, it's. Um, I must have been born with something because it, it run, it's it been running through me my whole life. Yeah. It's never gone away. But you said I know you what identified that is. with I know what that is. Yeah. That I liked it. I loved it. It was No, fun. no, no. I, I feel like it, it, it defined, and it defined me. It's like, you know, somebody, when I was a little kid, they asked me, what, what you know, what do you like? I'm like, well, I'm a musician. <laughs> I would tell them that. What? I was seven years old. Yeah. I'm a musician. They'd laugh. But I was. Cute. <laughs> it was. You are, yeah. so cute. It was cute, all right. It's still cute. But I never won the damn talent show. Yeah, you did. Oh. Yeah, you did. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just years later. 
I wanted it then, though. <laughs> Keyboards come into the mix if you started with the guitar. So about when I when I was about ten, I started really getting bored with the guitar. I, I don't know. I just I wasn't I wasn't feeling it. And uh, my father always wanted a theater organ in the house for whatever reason. I'll never figure out why. And my mother really wanted a piano. She and secretly I because she wanted to learn how to play piano. Okay, yeah. She never had the opportunity as a kid. And. Uh, so we had these neighbors that were selling this Baldwin baby grand piano, this white piano, and she wanted it so badly. And my dad was like, I don't piano. We're going to get an organ. So, of course, he, he pitted me against her. And he says, what do you want? And, of course, yeah, I'm a little kid. I'm like, oh, look at all the buttons. And, you know, I, let's get the organ. I want the one that plugs you know, in. I realized, I realized I, it's the first time I think I ever saw my mother crushed. And, oh. uh, and, and in retrospect, I was such a fool because... I, you know, ultimately I became a piano freak and I would have been that much further along the line, you know, yeah. but and, is yeah, so I got the organ and, uh, at 11 and then forget it. It was, you know, and there weren't, there really was nobody playing keyboards, you know, nobody could play keyboards. So my dad bought me a portable organ, you know, uh, uh, with an amplifier yeah. and, uh, and, uh, I was off and running, playing in bands and just going crazy, you know, and then of course I turned like. 13 and 14 and discovered smoking pot and forget it man it became the you know and, and the Beatles got really good <laughs> well it, it changed it changed what I started listening to um, you know before that I was like uh, what were the bands I was into well I loved Cream but I never thought of Cream as a psychedelic band but eventually I did. Right. <laughs> but, but I understand what that meant. You know, uh, I was into the Stones, and I still love the Beatles, and I'll, I'll, always. And um, what else? Was that? Uh, when Led Zeppelin first came out, I was a real Led Zeppelin freak, and Grand Funk Railroad. You know, right. All the good so stuff. there was this older kid up the street from me. He was a drummer, and a br and a brilliant scientist. Wow. And to this day, I mean, he's he's head of uh, pathology at like all these hospitals in New York, and but he was a he was a drummer and uh, and he had really good taste in music and he he called me over his house one day after school and he says you got to hear this so he and he was also the only one I knew that had an actual real stereo like a you know, everybody had these console stereos and right. hi fi's they call them yeah. oh, the yeah. big he had like a, a receiver with speakers oh. in his room and it was like wow that was so cool you know and so he, we sit down <laughs> and uh, he had a um, he had a turntable and he put on this album and it was uh, a band called Poco. I don't know if you're familiar. So he puts it on and I was just transported somewhere instantly. Like I've never heard, I've never heard any, no, I've never heard anything like this before. And I was, I, I went out and bought the record and I just wore the sucker out. The, the the vocals the the the, the, the uh, arrangements of the tunes and the, and the jamming that these guys did on this record it's a great story too as part of the record uh, some studio engineer spilled a coke on the tape and ruined like three cuts and they and they were on a deadline so they didn't know what to do so they had this one tune it was kind of open open kind of tune you know and they went in and just played for like 18 minutes. And that side of the record is just this them playing, it's and it's yeah. incredible. And it's just because of yeah. a Coke. Yep, just because of a Coke. So yeah, that's, that's right after that, right after that, um, I was uh, in my another friend's uh, living room. And we cut school, and I smoked my first pot, and you know the rest is history. First song I ever heard high, Chest Fever by the band. That's a good person. And really twisted. <laughs> I did it, man. Whoa. So we're, we're sitting in his living room, and he has acoustic guitar, and he's playing this song. And I'm just like, what is that? He goes, oh, it's a song by the Grateful Dead, man. I'm like, Grateful Dead? What a cool name. Who the hell are the Grateful Dead? He goes, you don't know the Grateful Dead? I was like, no. I said, what, what, what is it? He goes, well, it's called Casey Jones, man. And he's playing this tune, you know, driving that train. I'm just like, wow. 
<laughs> what's going on? You know how when you're not aware of something, you're not aware of it. Yeah. But as soon as you are aware of it, it's everywhere. Like you buy a, a certain kind of car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You start seeing that car everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. I never so noticed those. I go to the local mall near my house. It's an outdoor mall. It's a record store. And the entire window of the record store is festooned <laughs> with Grateful Dead. Because they just released uh, the Skull and Roses album. And there was Grateful Dead, Grateful Dead, Grateful Dead. And at school, everybody's talking about Grateful Dead. I, I never even heard of these guys. And now they're everywhere. So... Very, very soon after that, uh, I was, uh, I had this room in my basement. Uh, <laughs> I laugh because I, I think of my mother. I, t I stole all her tinfoil <laughs> and stapled it to the walls of this room. Oh Bought gosh. blacklight paint. Yeah. Got a blacklight, po blacklight posters, you know. Wow. And uh, this is another, it's so weird, like back back then this is the probably 19 uh, maybe early 1971 okay. FM radio was like a, a new thing okay stereo FM radio album format radio was brand new it was, they, before that everything was pop radio right so they were playing album cuts on the radio so it's really cool you know and then you had these these, these DJs who'd go uh, hi uh, so we're gonna we're gonna play a cut from the new Grateful Dead record you know and it's like, oh, these guys it's like, like oh, scary. scary. So I'm in this room one day and uh, got the radio on. And all of a sudden, this song comes on. And I don't know what I was doing, but I just was like, what is that? Yeah. And of course, what is it? It's Grateful Dead, folks. I didn't know. All of a sudden, they're playing this song. And the song ends. And the, and the guy comes on. And it, it, it just so happened it was the last of like three cuts that he played in a row. So I didn't have to wait. He goes... Uh, the, uh, that was a cut uh, from uh, The Grateful Dead, from uh, Working Man Dead. That was uh, Uncle John's band. Um, and I, I was just like, wow, this is it. This is it. This is like, it's the same feeling I got seeing the Beatles for the first time. Oh, wow. Here it is that I'm really wow. catching a clue. Yeah. What's happened? Yeah. So, Getting closer and closer to that. And then it, it found you. A, a day or two later, uh, we had, we had, were very close to... Uh, uh, I had these cousins. They were actually my second cousins. Uh, they lived very close to me. And we would visit them all the time. And uh, I happened to be there. And my cousin Mary is, uh, was five years older than me. So she was already, by that time, I think she was about to go to college. Uh, or she was in college, maybe. And I'm rifling through her record collection. And there's Working Man Dead. And I went, Mary, can I borrow this record? She goes, yeah, go ahead. Take it home. So Working Man Dead... The very first cut is Uncle John's band on side A. And on side B, the very last cut is Casey Jones. So what did I do? Put on Uncle John's band. Song comes to an end. Take the needle off the record. Flip it over. Casey Jones. I never listened to anything else. Just those two songs over and over and over. So I called were my... Were you playing with them? Like, you know, at that time, like, you were listening to them. Were you trying to learn them? Yeah, I, I actually I picked up my guitar and learned the songs, you okay. know, the Casey Jones and Uncle John's band, and played along. And I called my friend Daniel over. I said, "You got to hear this stuff," because he never heard of the Grateful Dead either. So I put on Uncle John's band, and he's blown out of his socks. So we started talking, and all of a sudden the song ends. And instead of me flipping the record over, it just kept going. And the next song is "You Told Me Goodbye." And the two of us just stopped in mid sentence, like, and just then we just listened to the whole record, silent, just silence. Listen to the whole record, and that was it. I was done, deadhead, completely, utterly, and um, I don't. Know, it wasn't really that long after that. Uh, some friends of mine were like, "Grateful Dead are coming to New York. You gotta go." With That's us. what I was gonna ask. So, yeah. this was the end of '71. They were playing at the Felt Forum at Madison Square Garden, and uh, they all bought tickets. And I had a ticket, and my mother was like, there's no way in heaven or hell that you are going to see the, that band. Really? I'm like, that's why? Me, she me. goes, you are not going there and take drugs. Oh. I'm like, I'm not going there to take drugs. I'm going there for the music, which is half lie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a half truth. But it's a half truth. <laughs> so she wouldn't let me go, and I, I, I missed it. And the next day at school, I had to sit there and hear and him. listen to, and it was the it was the new writers open the show, and then the dead. So they start going, 
my God, when the new riders came out and started playing, we're, we were like, there can't be a band that's this good. There's no way. And then the dead came out and forget it. Just, just oh, destroyed the world place. Apart, yeah. you know? So, I don't know, a month or so later, they come up to me again. The dead are coming back to New York in March. And I told my mother, I was like, I'm going to show. If you don't let me go, I'm going to run away. You'll never see me again, and I promise you, I'll do it. And she knew I was serious, and I was. Oh, you, you, I, weren't, you weren't bluffing. You, no, no. I, oh, okay. Like, I was like, I don't go to that show. I'm, I'm gone. You'll never see me again. I don't know what that meant, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I was serious. But you were and my father just went, let him go. It's <laughs> the worst that can happen to him. <laughs> so he'll shut up. I told my mother, he goes, he goes, he goes, what's the worst that can happen? I'll end up in Bellevue, which was the a psych hospital no, no, in New York. Yeah. You know? So I go to the Dead Show uh, at the Academy of Music in New York, and it turns out that it's the last show in New York before they go to do the Europe tour, 72. Oh, shit. And uh, the show opens with trucking, and Phil Lesh literally just pulled me in. He just pulled me in all night. It was like he just he she twisted my brain. And I was, that's how I, the dead for me was all about Phil. Everybody loved Jerry and Bob, and it's always been about Phil for me. So they're Phil. with Phil and being well, in this band in yeah. the woods. You imagine, it, so. That's meeting your Talk about dream yeah. coming true and so, like. You know, life goes north. on, and uh, you know, I grow up, I go to college and for music and blah, blah, blah. And you know, at, out of college, I'm working in bands and I'm playing, I'm making a living, but it's not really a living, you know, yeah. as a struggling Goodbye. musician. Getting by, then I fell in love and got married. Had two kids. Uh, my on the road? You fell in love on the road? No, okay. I wasn't on the road. You know, just oh, home. Just, 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 just at home. Just, yeah, I was doing weddings and stuff. Oh, okay. Man, it was awful. Oh. <laughs> but they paid decent money, you know. Right. And and then you know, one thing led to another, and uh, through the Cosby Show, I got a I got my first road gig, and it was working for an R and B singer named Freddie Jackson. Yeah. Huge yeah. With, uh, with black know. audiences, uh -huh, you know. Yeah. You are my lady. Yeah, everything I. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I get my first road gig, and we travel the whole country. That was a really beautiful song. Yeah, like, it was. Seriously. And so I'm up on this on this riser, playing keyboards, and I have these three insanely beautiful women in front of me in these little tiny black dresses just shaking their booties and I was just like <gasps> every night I was like I married I married I married I love my children oh my god and uh, yeah it was a it was a trip that's it's a real test. shit though yeah, that's no, real no, really, it was real and, uh, but for me you know now I when I went to college uh, I, I went to school as a classical organ major and I hated it so much that I switched to piano. And right there, I, I also got turned on to uh, to the jazz pianists. Um, McCoy Tyner, Oscar Peterson, Chick Corea. Oh, okay. And I was just, I was in, that's it. You know, Grateful Dead? <laughs> this is real. This is really deep. And that's where I gravitated to, you know. And uh, so, jazz is very I, it is. And, and, for me, it was like the, it was the natural extension of the Grateful Dead because the whole improv thing really prepared me yeah. to right. to go in that direction. So I I studied jazz and I played in jazz groups and uh, and that's what I was doing. So Freddie Jackson just you know uh, it's just for me there's no there was no improv. It was the same show note for note every night, and I mean note for note, even like the solos. You got one solo. But you had to write your solo, and that's the solo you played every night. And if I dared, Freddie would come up to me at the show, go, "You didn't play your solo." I'd be like, "I'm like thinking, how do you possibly know that?" Well, of course he knows. He's a great musician. Yeah. You know? he's listening. Yeah, yeah, he's really listening. I mean, he was very serious about his show, and it was it was actually fun music. It really was. But to play it night after night, it's got, I mean, no, it's, the, the thrill is gone. After after one night, yeah. yeah. You know, me, I, I, you know, I had played in all these uh, dead cover bands. And, and, yeah. and, you know, you, you, you know, it's in the spirit of the Grateful Dead. Nothing's ever the same. Yeah. 
anything I played, nothing was ever the same. Even the wedding bands, like I always improvised the shit. The wedding band leader would get so pissed off at me. <laughs> you know? You're not cooperating. We, we actually, we, we had this one wedding band, it was a house band, which was really cool not to have to keep going to different places all the time. Yeah. So we're in the same yeah. place every weekend. We do like two to three uh, to four weddings a weekend. Nice. No, it wasn't nice. Well, it was awful. Nice money. <laughs> but it was good money. Yeah, nice it was good money. money and I never had to move any of my gear. It just sat there. Cool. So, yeah. so are you the, a dad at this time? Yeah, my daughter. My daughter was little when this was going on. Okay. It's before my son. Uh, so, <laughs> the, the band leader quits the band, and we, I, to tell the guys in the band, uh, I know this guy would be great band leader. This guy was a friend of mine forever. A really good guitar player, really good singer, and he agreed to do it. He comes in, and as soon as he became the band leader, he became the world's biggest asshole ever. I mean, barking orders at everybody. And, like, he would turn around to me and go, you're not playing that right. It's not correct. I'm like, fuck you, man. Sorry. I don't know. I'll have to you can say fuck you. Okay, yeah. Fuck you. You can't tell me what to do. I hired you for this gig. He goes, I'm the band leader now. You know? So so what we would do is we, me and the bass player, the drummer, would conspire. <laughs> And, and we, we'd play the tunes in odd time signatures and stuff. And it drove him mad. When the New York Mets were in the World Series in 1986, I was playing a wedding on game six, and I had a transistor radio with a piece in my ear. And he keeps turning around and he goes, take that out of your ear. I'm like, no fucking way, man. This is my team. They're in the World Series. People in the wedding are coming up to me. You see my game? What's the score? What's going on? You know, it's, it's against Boston, you know. So... Well, we drove this poor guy crazy, but anyway, uh, uh, so playing in, playing in all these weird, you know, wedding bands, and I was playing in a, in, in a, uh, a really cool jazz band called Eclipse, uh, which is how I got the Cosby show. Okay. Uh, the music director for Cosby heard us in a studio one day and loved us and asked us if we were interested in doing TV work. And we're like, TV work? What TV work? He goes, well, I'm the music director of Bill Cosby. And the Cosby Show had just, it was brand new. It was the first season. And they were using, oh, wow. they were using all the L.A. studio guys. Right. Like all the, the, the real the heavy, hitters. the heavy hitters. Right. So I said to him, I said, what do you want to work with us for? You, you're working with Cornell Dupree and all these guys out in L.A. Why do you want us? He goes, because Bill doesn't want to have to go out to California every weekend. Because they were taping the show in New York City. In Queens at the Silver Cup Studios, and he says we want to keep it local, so it's a lot easier for us. And that's how I got that gig. So I went on tour with them, and it was my second night home from tour. And I get a call from uh, an old friend of mine. Uh, it was a drummer who used to play in this Dead cover band with me. And uh, he says, "What are you doing tonight?" I said, "Nothing." He says, "I'm playing at the Right Track Inn uh, with this band called the Zen Tricksters. Do you want to?" Come down and play. You know all the tunes. I was like, what do you play? He goes, Grateful Dead. I was like, oh. All right. So I go down there and I sit in with these guys. And uh, the lead guitar player is Jeff Matson, okay. who is now the lead guitar player of Dark Star Orchestra. Yeah. And uh, I really dug the way he played. You know, I liked that. And I liked him as a person. He was a really quirky guy and really intelligent. But I had a great time playing with him. And, you know, I said goodbye. Well, yeah. So that was a Saturday night. Sunday morning. About nine o'clock in the morning, their bass player calls me on the phone. He says, um, Jeff and I talked after the gig last night and we want you to be the keyboard player. And I'm like, yeah, but you have a keyboard player. Yeah, but we don't we don't want to work with him anymore. I was like I was like, eh, listen, man, I c I can't do that in all good consciousness. I can't usurp somebody's gig. Yeah, and so I hung up with him. About an hour later, I get a conference call. And this is the first time I didn't even know you could do such a thing. And I got the two of them. I got a Jeff Madsen and this bass player, Steve, on the phone. And they're going, no, dude, you don't understand. We're, we, Joey's taking a month off. And he's going to call you to take his place for a month. And we're, it's going to be like a coup. I'm like, oh. I don't know. I get off the phone with them, and an hour later, their keyboard player calls me. This guy Joey, and he and he was a really funny guy. Spoke with this really heavy New York accent, like, "Hey, how you doing?" <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, I'm taking a month off. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you want to like do uh, a two, three, a dozen of the gigs. You know, what do you think? I'm like, um, "Yeah, I could do that." You know, all right, I'll 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 do the gigs. And uh, hour later, they call the other guys. Call me back. Did he call you? I was like, "Yeah." 
All right, it's all set. It's like this is an all-day thing going on. And an hour after that, I get another phone call from Joey. I can't fucking believe you did that to me. I'm like, Joey, I didn't do anything, man. I, he goes, no, I can't believe you stole my gig. I was like, I didn't do anything. I told them no. He goes, you know what? Fuck you. It's your gig now. So that's how I ended up in the Zen Tricksters. Now, it was only once a week. They only played on Saturday night. But my ex-wife, when I told her that I was going to be doing this, she just looked at me and went, are you nuts? Your, your music career is just starting to go. Why would you, why would you go backwards? And I, and I said, you know, it's funny, but I really feel like I have to get back to some semblance of roots. I'm losing myself. This Freddie Jackson thing is not where I need to be. And I can't do weddings for the rest of my life. I'll shoot myself. And uh, she was not having it. So it started a lot of tension, you know. And then, then they started working more. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> now we have two kids at this point, you know. So. But uh, playing with the Zen Tricksters was a really interesting gig because uh, we we did some Grateful Dead stuff, but we also did tons of our own music. We had, we had a huge repertoire of original music. And he really liked my music. I loved his music, and we were writing constantly and, and, and playing all this really cool music. And then we also would uh, play well-chosen covers, like things that we really okay. dug. Like yeah. uh, Jeff is a huge Richard Thompson freak, so we would do a bunch of Richard Thompson songs, right you know, on. and uh, a, a couple of traffic tunes, you know, different, different. Peppering them in there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, 10 years goes by, and I'm... I gave up doing weddings and I played with the Zen Tricksters and starved. I mean, literally had no money, and ended up getting ended up getting a divorce. And because she couldn't deal with it, she was uh, she was a nurse uh, and she was like on this elite open heart team. She was hanging out with doctors and nurses, and she wanted that whole upper middle class dream. And you know, we're, I can't, what am I going to get? Oh, wow. Playing the keyboard and the yeah. Grateful Dead cover yeah, right. and those traffic yeah. traffic tunes. Right. Yeah. Trying to get so. Back to your roots. So we we decided to make our we made our first CD uh, and uh, came out pretty decent uh, and then we decided well it's time to make another one we had so much music yeah. so we got uh, some friends to invest some money and we did it for real like we went into a really nice studio and and did it and uh, when we were done and got the first pressings I, I called a friend of mine who at that time was a, a writer for Relics magazine. Uh, his name is J.C. Juanis. And J.C. Uh, lived in San Francisco. Uh, really, really nice cat. And uh, I called him up. I said, listen, man, uh, I want to send you a copy of our new CD. Maybe you could review it for the magazine. He goes, absolutely. Can't wait to hear it. I said, I want to send you a second CD because I know you're friends with Phil. And I would love it to get some feedback from him to see what he thinks we're doing. And we really, um, our second CD really showcased our jamming prowess. Like, and we had really taken it in a, <laughs> an interesting direction. Um, uh, you know, a lot of jazzy influence, but yet still you could, you know, you could hear the thread of the dead in it, but it really wasn't dead-like. Yeah. Okay. It was our own thing. Yeah, and I, was, I, I just wanted feedback from Phil, you know, because how cool would that be if he goes, wow, this is really great, I love it. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. <laughs> Careful what you ask for, Rob. So this is de this is December of '98, and now fast forward to September of '99, uh, and we pull into San Francisco uh, one evening to play a show. We've been on the road for like almost a month, and I was just. I was so burnt at the end of my rope. I was sitting in the back of the van going over the uh, Oakland Bay Bridge. And I'll never forget sitting in that back bench, just going, I, I need, I need intervention. I need something. Something's got to happen here because if something doesn't happen, I, I don't know how I'm going to go on. You know, not, I'm not talking no, suicide. No, no, yeah. I'm, no, I mean, yeah. but I got to. Something's got to happen, you know. And uh, so we get to the gig, and uh, we set up, we do our sound check, and now I'm in the dressing room, and the door opens, and Jason Wedwanis comes in, and he, uh, hey, how you doing? We exchange pleasantries, and. I said, hey, you ever give that CD to Phil? He goes, yeah. I said, you ever hear anything? He goes, no. And Jeff Matz and I just looked at each other and went, ugh, oh, he hated it. Oh, oh, let the air out of your tires. And it was just, 
and we played our show and it was fine. And, and the next morning, uh, you know, we were, the way, we were traveling in a van, so you always would get a hotel, you stay in a hotel for, you know, maybe you slept four or five hours, you get up and you get off to the next town, you know, and usually the drives were pretty ridiculous, you know, and we were heading up to Oregon. Uh, so we had to stop and get gas and we pulled into one of these convenience store gas stations and at this time no one had a cell phone this was people were just starting okay so everybody heads to the phone bank and uh, I had a girlfriend who lived in Portland and I called her and Jeff I was living with Jeff and he called our house to get our messages so I'm on the phone with her, and the first thing she says to me, listen, your, uh, your booking agent's been calling here all morning uh, trying to get a hold of you. He wanted me to tell you, you got to call him immediately. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. What the fuck did he fuck up now? You know, oh, I can't. I'm just, this is really, she goes, no, she goes, no, it's, I, I, he sounded really happy. I don't know, it sounded like it was something really good or something, you know. She goes, she goes maybe Phil Lesh called you. Joking. She, I swear to God, she said that. And all of a sudden I turn, I look at Jeff Matson, and he's just clutching the phone with like this bone death grip. And, and he's looking at me and he goes, you'll never believe who left a message on our phone. I was like, whoa. He goes, Jill Lesh. <laughs> I'm what? like, that's bullshit, Jeff, come on. He goes, well, she left a phone number. I said, Julie, I gotta call you back. Call that number now. And he gets on the phone and calls and sure enough, Jill Lesh answers the phone. Oh, you know, and I, they talk for like 10 minutes. And I'm like sitting there sweating. What are you bullets? talking about? What are you? Yeah, what are they saying? So he gets on? off the phone. He hangs up the phone. He looks at me. He goes, "Well, Phil really loves our CD, and he wants me to come and play with him." I went, hey, "You know that? Oh, great. Like, good just give you. me the samurai sword now." <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, "And you too." Oh, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. So. So we're we're like dancing around this parking Are you lot. Crying uh, at this point? Like, I I probably was. Yeah, yeah. It was we were you know we were so jubilant and, and and the rest of my bandmates are looking at us like you know like what the heck? you know they're they're like the redheaded stepchild at this oh, point you know, no. but but we you know um, I come to find out that J C had given them the C D, and uh, this was in the in the infancy of Phil Lesh and friends and uh, they um. They were moving their office, so the CD got lost in the shuffle of moving their office. It just so happened that Jill had an assistant. His name is Doe Valdez, and Doe was a big fan of the Zen Tricksters. And he found the CD that very day that we played that show in San Francisco. What? And Phil was listening to music every night, trying to find other musicians to play with. Because even back then, he was on a mission. He wanted to keep playing with different people all the time. Yeah. So he put, he puts, he just, it you know, just thing. for him, that's what he, you know, he just it, figured okay. it'd be really cool to, to get, get diverse yeah. readings of music. And so Doe put our CD on the top of the pile. So Phil gets in bed, puts, gets his Walkman out, his, his oh Sony gosh, disc yes. man, <laughs> puts our disc in, puts his headphones on, and, and immediately wakes Jill up and goes, you gotta call these guys tomorrow morning. Oh, shit. You gotta find out how to get a hold of these guys. And and so our booking agent's number was on the CD. And that's why the booking agent was trying to get a hold of me. Of course, I never even called him after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah why would you call him? Yeah. yeah. I got so, Phil's number now. So and and really the rest is history. I mean, um, you know, we did we did three shows at the Warfield, uh, Jeff and I, and then uh, Phil asked me, he says, I'm, I'm going to do my first national tour, um, and we have we pretty much have the band together, but we don't have a keyboard player, and I would love it if you do it. So we went on tour with Dylan, and I was the keyboard player, and it was Warren Haynes, and it was supposed to be Steve Kimmock. But Steve, yeah? That's time. Yeah, I saw it. Anyway, the rest is his job. I have one last thing. Did yeah. you ever get to play, have you played your first show? As Dark yes. Star. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, 328.72. Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs>
Both the defense mechanism as well as a fear. We've traveled this road before, so we may think. But it's a tad bit of strange similarities that feed an A equal A complex. The fears of your past do not equal the perplexities of the current road.